Uh, there we go. Great. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, fantastic uh, to see you. I'm so glad we have the opportunity to chat. Yes. I'm very pleased indeed. It was lovely to have that little moment together on, on that um, uh, other uh, podcast or whatever it was. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've been very interested by, by your work. What interested you in mine? How did you get to hear, hear about it even? Well, uh, I don't know when the first, I mean, I've been aware of it for a long time. I don't know where the first, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure where the first time was, but um, I'm super interested in this um, this notion of uh, understanding nature, as it were, in both directions. So I like the the sort of re reductive quantitative stuff, but I also think it's it's really important to uh, go go at it the top down, as it were, in in, in my language. But this yes. is you know these are the things that I mean you you integrate it very beautifully, and you write about the importance of it. Um, you know, and of course uh, in in connection with with neuroscience, but also more broadly i'm I, you know i'm also uh, friends with um, people like mark solms who who also take a kind of a um, psychology psych psychiatry psychology approach to it i think i think it's uh, i think mm. it's very important um to have both both mm. ends so and so yeah uh, i've been i've been following uh, following your writings for a really long time no yeah. that's that's great to know yeah. yes um and i gather you're actually on the editorial board of laterality which correct <laughs> which correct. is interesting yeah, so you're obviously interested in lateralization as well, which is not something and I I didn't I twigged actually, but um, yeah. So this is so so I have uh, three things that I wanted to ask you about, and then of course anything that you would mm. like to talk about. But the but the asymmetry thing is one of them. Um, mm. When when I was a grad student uh, with, in Cliff Tabin's lab, we characterized the first set of uh, asymmetry genes. So these were the these. This is the pathway that sets the the laterality of the organs of the body. So not so much. I haven't done any work on brain laterality per se, but this was this was the question of how do your uh, internal organs d d reliably determine left from right in the in in embryogenesis. And so this is this is how I ended up on the board of laterality, not from from brain uh, asymmetry, but but through them through for years we studied mechanisms of of uh, left right determination, and I think. It's and as I'm, I think you you say as well. I think it's a it's a very profound problem. It goes well beyond mm. the kind of you know these issues of of the heart positioning and stuff like that. It's a, I, oh. I think you know I think it's it I think it's yeah very profound the way the way to um, uh, amplify these chiralities that exist. We we chased it down to the single cell level basically, and other people have as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So, so, so I was really interested, you know, I, I saw your, your quote on Pasteur and the importance of asymmetry. So I just, I was hoping you would talk about that a little yes. bit. Yes, definitely. And um, talk about it going back a bit further than the positioning of the heart. Um, as I point out, uh, Thomas Holstein um, found that in uh, Nematostella vectensis, the oldest extant organism we have, 700 million years old, um, there is already lateralization in what he calls the ancestor of the vertebrate brain. So in this neural network, there is already asymmetry. And it, it's fascinating. It's, as you say, Pasteur thought that this was a, a fundamental aspect of, well, he, he said a fundamental aspect of the cosmos. And, and Pierre Curie said the same and that asymmetry in in living organisms is part of a reflection of that so yeah so it's certainly an it's a it's a primary problem if i remember rightly was not your research on i haven't looked at this for a decade or more but wasn't your research on how an organism gets to know its left from its right um part of the argument which i know you've taken very much further um, that it's to do with bioelectrical uh, gradients. Is that not right? This is right. Uh, one of the many things that bioelectricity does is scale up decision left-right uh, decisions made by individual cells. So people have now found chirality in bacteria, in single human cells, in culture, in a dish. Um, all yeah, we we found it in slime molds. Um, all kinds of. I mean, it's as you say, it's it's completely fundamental. And one of the things that we found that uh, the bioelectric system does is scale up the very early left-right decisions made by individual cells into a collective decision about 
uh, as an organ, so a, a collective of these cells, what side of the body am I located on? So to me, what I love about this is because everything that we've been focused on is this idea of scaling. How do you go from little tiny competent agents to great big ones that that integrate with a larger cognitive light cone and um, and and you know in this in this unified mm. perspective. So this was the first uh, I, I you know this was the first example of this that I really um, got to work on as a grad student and then a postdoc. How the bioelectrics actually serves as this glue that that binds individual decisions into organ level decisions. Yeah, and I I get that, and I think that's fascinating. But I don't want to lose if there's a lot more to say. I'm sure for both of us about asymmetry. But one of the things is that when you take that to the level of the morphology of an organ, or or the morphology of something as extraordinary as the eye, or even the brain, um. I guess you're not claiming that you cracked it, but I'd like to know <laughs> how your theory about bioelectric bioelectrical gradients fits into orders of explanation, because it seems to me that it explains things at one level, but it might be uh, not unlike saying, how did Holbein paint this incredible portrait of Sir Thomas More? Well, he used striated muscles in his uh, <laughs> in his arm and his hand, yeah. and there was also input from the higher centers in the brain. But in a way, is it not just a description at a rather reduced level of something that still requires um, unpacking and is not really explained by talking about bioelectrical gradients? So I 100% agree with you that uh, explanations purely at the physical level miss the mark, and, and I'm, I'm completely in agreement with that. Uh, I do think, however, that one of the neat things about bioelectricity, and it's not unique, there are some other modalities that work this way too, is that it allows us to, uh, to, to, to uh, merge levels. So it is, it, is, it is a kind of mechanistic explanation which leads us directly to a cognitive explanation. In other words, it and 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 I'm not by no means am I saying I, I've cracked the whole thing, but but I think that the nice thing about bioelectricity is that it shows you how large scale information processing, which you can imagine can can rise up to the kinds of explanations that we really want for these complex events, how that arises from uh, individual mechanisms. So. What I like about it is that is that uh, I think what evolution does is it uses bioelectricity to get meaning and computation out of physics. And that's I, I, I think that's what we need in the end. The physical, the physical events are great, but what we need is to find out where the meaning comes from. And I think that bioelectric, yeah. the, the bioelectrics is a, is, a, is a step in that direction. Because, and, that and direction. I'll just take a step away from the, from the asymmetry for the moment. Um, in, our, in our work on, uh, let's say, from the regenerative medicine angle, you know, we want to understand how do the cellular collectives know to make one organ rather than another? And the treatment yes. is not going to be bottom up, which is what molecular medicine works on now, which is tweaking the gene, the, the genes and the pathways. I want to literally, literally convince the, the cells that they should be building something different than what they're building now. I mean, I t I, I'm not using mm. this as a, as a metaphor. I'm mm. uh, uh, other than everything yes. is kind of a metaphor, but I'm, I'm completely serious about that. <laughs> and so, yes. Yes. right. And, and so what we need to understand is, is how do these electrical networks store memories? How do they have preferences? How do they... Uh, mm. navigate the space of possible uh, anatomical um, uh, outcomes. And, and I think what they're doing is a tiny sort of precursor uh, to uh, what happens in the brain. And I think they allow us mechanistically to talk about the, the, the memories, the, um, the beliefs, in, in, you know, in a proto form, of course, of tissue that is not neural tissue. Uh, and, uh, and, and that, that's, so, so that's, so, so I'm hoping, I'm trying to develop that link. Exactly. I don't think that the mechanistic explanation is sufficient, but I think the bioelectrics gets us beyond that. It literally lets us cash out what does it mean for a collective of tissue to hold a counterfactual memory. For example, we've seen that in planaria, where we actually have mm. animals whose tissues hold a counterfactual memory of what they would do if they got injured in the future at some point. And and this is, you know, so this is this and 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 I can tell a similar story about the, the asymmetry as well. So how does the counterfactual Sorry, you have to excuse me because I'm an outsider to this area. Um, but how does that memory become instantiated over time? And how does it contain information about hugely complex three-dimensional 
configurations such as the way in which intricate parts of the brain need to be organized how can it hold that information and, and where does it store it and and, and and you know slime molds as i discovered um are creatures to be respected um they're able to do extraordinary things like solve mazes and escape from their jars and all this sort of thing but um, <laughs> Clearly, they don't have neurons. So, where where for them is this um, is this memory stored? Yeah. So, so the slime molds. Uh, I'll start with that, just because so much less is known that I can tell that quickly. Um, we we have a particular assay where you put a little slime mold piece in the middle of a petri dish, about ten centimeters diameter, and then you put some glass discs at the edges. Three glass discs at one edge, one glass disc at the other edge. These are just glass. There's no chemicals, there's no food, there's no attractant, uh, just, just glass. They're very thin, they're very light, but there's three over here, there's one over here. What the slime mold does for the first few hours is, is it, it gently um, rhythmically tugs on the medium that they're all sitting on, a, on an agar kind of a slab sort of thing, right? And it makes these waves and it turns out that it senses biomechanically the strain angle that comes back to it after it pulls on this thing. And for the first four hours, it basically... Uh, builds an internal uh, something, and we don't know exactly what, although I, I give you a, a hypothesis. Uh, it, it integrates that information doing not much for the first four hours. And then it grows out towards the three disks, not the one it chooses. It always mm. chooses the three. And so during right. that time, right, it's sort of a pulling together some sort of representation of what's going on in the outside world. For some mm. reason, it likes mm. the heavier masses better than light masses. I don't know why. Uh, and really? then it makes a decision, and then you see the observable behavior. One of the things yeah. we've done is we've injected um, uh, fluorescent beads through this thing. And when you watch the beads flow in and out, what you see is that as it branches, you know, it's very a branched uh, structure, right? Like almost fractal in its, in its nature. Um, when, the, when the beads are going down uh, one particular vein, and then there are branches, sometimes they go to the branch, and sometimes they don't. We, it, and and the, so so these juncture points they open and close. The thing has complete control over every juncture point. So it's basically a, a biomechanical synapse at that point, right? You can if you can control the flow of 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 the, you know going this way or going that way. This is the beginnings of some sort of um hydraulic com computer, I think, where you can actually start to process information by directing uh where where the flow of uh of, of molecules are going to go through your network it's very it's not a garden hose where everything just sort of goes under pressure it's very um mm. you know millions mm. and millions of selectable points right and and people like andy mm. adametsky think a lot about how you take that architecture and do computations with it and make decisions and, and things like that so they have a very mm. rich cytoskeletal network they have bioelectrical phenomena which we really haven't studied yet although andy has uh, they've got this hydraulic thing going on, um, but it's very clear that they have periods of integrating information and then acting on it, you know, um, in addition yes. to the memory yes. kinds of kinds of things that you talk about. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that sounds absolutely fascinating. Uh, I, I, I still find it difficult to know where we jump the gap from a mechanism in which a, a pathway can be closed or opened to where... Um, something like the three-dimensional structure of how you get through a maze is stored you know uh, but that's that's yeah. that's surely something to to be working on <laughs> yeah yeah well you know yeah. Aud audrey de Sautour in in, uh, in in france has this amazing data where she's got she's got these slime molds and, and the slime mold uh, dislike salt they don't want to crawl over salt sure and right and she'll no. train them she'll train them to crawl over the salt to get the reward but then when she asked, okay, so and so it takes, I think, about 10 exposures for them to get the idea that it's okay and that at the end of the salt, there will be a nice piece of oat and whatnot. But um, what she found is that the way they remember to do this is they literally store a, some of that salt internally. So it's a memory. It's sort of pre-symbolic memory. It's like, I don't have a symbol for salt. I have the actual piece of this thing that I now need to know is okay, you know? Um, so it sounds to me like a very nice uh, sort of... Uh, you know, you're on your way to having some sort of a later, maybe a representation of it, but now you've got the actual, you know, the actual thing. That's wonderful. That's a lovely idea. Yes, yes. So they sort of internalize the idea that this salt is okay because it's in me now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, something, something like that, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, the previous, the previous thing you asked, which of course is the key question, 
is uh, how do you store pattern memories in these in in well at all? And so so this mm. one of the stories that we have is this: if you look at so so we've developed um, a voltage imaging um, uh, method, which is like so a sort of like brain imaging, except that instead of rapid spiking, what we're looking at is uh, very stable uh, spatially distributed resting potentials in tissue. So it's just much slow. It's a much slower set of phenomena. And what you can see in these planaria is that there's a there's a particular pattern, and much like what we've seen in the face of the frog and the brain of a nascent brain of the frog and so on, the, the, there's a there's a pre pattern that we've learned to decode. And what the pre pattern indicates is how many heads you're supposed to have. That pattern mm -hmm. by default, right? So 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 I think what the what the, what evolution has given us is an electric circuit with particular ion channels and such that by default settles onto an attractor that says one head. That's the pattern. And now why does it mean one head? Because that, I, I'll describe in a minute, the cells interpret it thus. So, so it has this pattern. What we can come along and do is not uh, touch the genome whatsoever, but give it a particular experience in physiological space using a blocker and, and a, or, or um, an ionophore of various ion channels and change that pattern so that it says two heads. And when you do this, Nothing happens for, a, for until you injure the animal. So what we have, and, and I have a, a nice videos of this, you can have an animal that is got it's it's got a completely normal anatomy, so one head. It's got completely normal gene expression, so 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 corresponding to a one-headed animal, but it has a different uh, representation of what a correct planarian looks like. How do I know? Because if we were to cut that animal, it would then use that mm. pattern memory to build what it says, which is mm. two heads. So prior yeah. to you, right? So prior to you doing that, it's a it's a primitive counterfactual because it doesn't reflect what's going on right now. It's a it's an early no. form, I think. It's an early form of this um mental time travel where you can hold on to an idea that you know it's not true. Either it's a memory of something that happened or it's a prediction of something that's going mm. to happen, but it isn't a reflection mm. of whatever stim inputs you're getting right now. So you've got these sort of schizophrenic worms that they have the body, they have a certain kind of body, right? But the memory of what constitutes a proper worm is quite different, and it's already been rewritten. Mm. And so, so I, I think this sort of thing is an early precursor. And then, and then, of course, you have to work out well how is this pattern interpreted. And so we have now yeah. uh, we have now computational models that show how a collection of cells looks at a pattern. Not not each cell reads its own voltage, but a but it's a group phenomenon. It only works in a, in a group how the collective of cells mm. reads a pattern and first of all, decides whether that's correct or not. And that's required for regeneration and repair and things like that, but also uh, how it will uh, uh, decide which organs to make downstream. And this is how Ooh. in the frog, we can now rewrite these patterns. And so we can make, we can put eyes on the tail and we can, we have six legged frogs and mm. things like this because mm. that's the reference point that they're using. And if you change the reference point, well, that's, there's nothing else for them to compare it to. They will happily, you know, the same genetics, the same mm. hardware mm. will happily execute a completely different program. Um, in fact, you can hop species this way. We've had planaria that make heads of other species in with, with 150 million years evolutionary distance, no genetic change needed, you know? Right. Right. So something very important about this, you use the word attractor, which I think is interesting because of course it's a non-mechanical um, propulsion. It's a, it's, an, it's a sort of a drawing together from something that is exerting an influence and where that is and what it is is an interesting question. Yes. And you also use, obviously you can't help using words like um, compare and decide and so on, but one's wondering what is it that's actually we can talk about the mechanism but again what is it that is it suggests some kind of decision making well that's yes, exactly yes, what it yes. is yes, yes. not just the following of a blindly of something but actually a, a decision and so this is intriguing um but yeah i mean you said also that it's it doesn't work on the level of a single cell but then it does doesn't it sometimes when parts of a cell that are remote from another part of a cell know that, that they need to be generating something that is um, deficient or defaulting in another part of the cell. Yes. So yes. that is intriguing because that seems to happen at the single cellular, yes. monocellular level. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no, absolutely. The well, when I said it doesn't happen, I just meant the the bioelectrics is not the, that's not the code. There's a different mechanism that will do that. Yeah, yeah you're, you're absolutely yeah. right. Um, you know, 
this this uh, w one of the things that we did recently was to examine um, models of gene regulatory networks, which are extremely simple sort of paradigms of of like deterministic, um, you know, genetic uh, kind of things. And what we found is that if you treat them as learning agents, meaning you pretend that uh, the different nodes could be conditioned stimulus, unconditioned stimulus response, they actually can exert six different kinds of memory. So they can do associative conditioning, right? They can do they can do uh, habituation, they can do sensitization, they can do um, associative learning, they can count to small numbers, they can do a few different things. And all of this is just in the super, super uh, um, minimal kinds of kinds of model. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary. What a wonderful area to be working in. <laughs> Too late for me. <laughs> but but um, I've, I've rather hijacked things by plunging into things I wanted to ask you, oh, but please, I know yeah. there were things you wanted to ask me, so please do feel free. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, well. So I have I have three things uh, on my mind. I wanted to um, hear you talk about the asymmetries and 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 you know, sort of as broad as you want, all the way up the scale to human uh, human life and so on. And and the other thing, maybe I'll start with the second thing because I think it's more um, self contained and and kind of simple. Um, I've been asking people this, and and uh, I, I would like to hear hear your opinion. Imagine, because I think I think it leads in some interesting areas. Imagine some sort of discrete positive experience, something pleasant that you enjoy, you know, um, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. And so now I'm going to give you two choices. The first choice is that you will get this experience now, but then all memory of it will be wiped afterwards. You will have no memory mm. of, of, of having had it, right? And probably you see where this is going. The other option is the exact opposite. I'm going to give you a memory of having had this experience and you will go on, but we're not going to actually do it. We, you know, we're just going to sort of, I'm going to implant the memory. And so what I'd love to hear is what do you think about that and which you prefer? I found people split uh, about 50-50 and they feel very strongly about which thing is obviously the thing to do. And I'd, I'd love to hear um, what you think about it. Well, it, it contains one of the elements in many, in a way, irresoluble philosophical problems that it is so counterfactual. It's like... Um, uh, you know, there are a number of these things that come up in, in, in my line, but can it, what does it mean? We have no way of knowing what it would mean to have a memory implanted, but there wasn't anything that caused it, if you see what I mean. If, it, if it's a real memory. Well, I mean, it, it's true that, sorry. Uh, no, please, please go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, but let's assume that a memory with all the force of the idea that it really has happened, um, ah, I, I don't know, but it, what it draws me back to was when I was training um, as a doctor, and uh, I remember obviously taking part of a number of endoscopies, and you would see somebody really suffering. They were squirming, they were obviously in pain, they were, um, you know, and I thought, oh, God, I never want to have one of these. And um, I remember saying to the um, the person who's doing it, you know, what do you feel about this? And they said, you go and talk to them afterwards. They have no memory of it at all. And then I thought, well, okay, uh, but how would it feel like if somebody said to me, um, I'm going to torture you within an inch of your life, but never mind, later you won't know anything about it. Mm. Um, and it struck me that this wasn't a satisfactory answer to say that the Valium or whatever it was would have, would have um, wiped out the trace of it. Probably yeah. because I believe that at some level, experiences are stored, even if they're not consciously stored, and they are part of you, and your experiences make up who you are. Mm -hmm. And it's just very difficult to say, yes, you can do what you like, as long as I don't remember it afterwards. I mean, that, that would be a very, because presumably, <sighs> There is a part of you, but that's perhaps hedging the bets. There is a part of you that actually does does remember it. So I wouldn't know quite how to go with this because I'm not sure that memory is is single. But you can, of course, since it's um, an artificial experiment, it's a thought experiment. You can set it up in any way you like. You can say, well, let's assume that you can't have any trace of memory, or you must have some absolutely full recall of this as though it were completely real. I don't know. <laughs> I've got an answer to that one. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, so 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 uh, I I believe, uh, and I think it was Tanagawa that did this. Um, had examples of incepting false memories in mice of of experiences that they've never actually had. Um, certainly, people are working on it, and I think I've seen some papers from his lab and others where. Uh, they're now they're using optogenetics to now give give animals, you know, sort of right into the brain, a clumsy version of what would have been written if they had had this experience. Right. So they sort of trace what the what the what you know, what the experience would be and try to mimic it with um, uh, with 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 optogenetic tools. And what I so so I. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I mean, how can we know what a mouse remembers? And indeed, like, how can we know? Do we actually have the knowledge to say that a whole experience is stored somewhere that you can actually find physically in the brain? Yeah. So, so I, I, I completely guarantee, um, agree with you that I don't think we understand the encoding or where it's located or anything like that. But uh, the kinds of work that he does, uh, I think, looks something like this. Um, you have a mouse that experienced being in a particular cage and it was very pleasant and it was very nice. And then later on, you give this mouse an electric shock in some other environment, and it's and it's unpleasant. And then what they can do is they can go in optogenetically, and they can link those two experiences, even though, and I don't know all the details, I'm not up on it, of even though those two experiences never went together. And what happens is that those mice, but not the control mice, when you put them in the cage, they show all the evidence of being afraid that they're about to be shocked. So the idea is you've, you've created a, an association that never existed. The mouse has never been shocked in that environment. In fact, everything was fine in that environment, mm. but you've now created. Mm. So, so, you know, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in this stuff, so I'm sure there are ways to critique it, but I think that's the, uh, that's, that's the, okay. idea. that's the evidence, you know, it's this kind yeah. of behavioral. Yeah. So, so what I find the reason, the reason I like this question, uh, I find when people try to explain, this is what I, this is what generally happens. One set of people will say, uh, I, I, all I have is memories of the past, you know, anything that happens now, it's going to be gone, uh, you know, moments from now, literally, and all I have are my memories. And so the experience means nothing to me long term, I, I collect memories of things. And that's what determines me are my memories. So I'll take, I'll take the memory, the, the actual experience is too fleeting, I'll, I'll take the long term memory. The other people say the opposite. And they say, uh, there is nothing but the current experience. These memories, I can't even be sure of, you know, whether my memories are critical or not. Who knows what happens with these memories? I want the actual experience, and I am right now. It's me, and I want to do this. Exp you know, I want to do this, and so, so, I, so I pick now, right? And it's really, I think, it's exactly what you said. It's very much related to this, uh, to, you know, torture and forget kind of thing, because if somebody offered you a million dollars for that experience, you might think. Well, future me is it was going to wish I'd taken the money, right? Uh, yeah. Present me doesn't want that, doesn't like it, but future me is going to say, "You dummy, you should have taken the money." I'd be, you know, I'd be in great shape now. I wouldn't have the trauma, but I'd have the million bucks. So I think. Yes, another thing. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, go on. Well, I just just to say that I think this really gets at the core of how people think about themselves and whether they're persistent yes. or right, and and all of that kind of stuff. Yes, well, there's a lot to say about that. I mean, one thing, one immediate um, um, observation is that it is absolutely impossible to recapture the rapture of um, of a, a, a transcendentally wonderful experience. You know that you had it in a kind of technical way. That it's there in the memory, as it were, but. But you can't remember what it is, much as, thank goodness, you can't remember what it was like to be in terrific pain. When you're in the pain is the time you know about it. Mm -hmm. um, so the memory is not really worth having, in essence. Um, it's, to that extent, it's only the having it that, that matters. But on the other hand, if what it has communicated to you and told you cannot be taken forward in your life, then that's also hugely diminished in, in value. So uh, surely our personalities, our preferences, our, our whole character as a person are, are made out of the experiences and the reactions to those experiences that go to weave a very, very rich tapestry. And so if, if they simply don't get to be stored anywhere or become part of the picture, then they've also been rather pointless. So in a way, what you've done is you've taken 
you've eliminated how each of these is really rather pointless on its own. It, you, mm. You've made a beautiful argument for the necessity of a degree of permanence. Mm. And the probably more interesting point that needs to be made is about the continuity of persons. So as you know, in The Matter With Things, um, I have a lot to say about time and flow through time. And uh, essentially a difference which you can find already in the way in which people respond to Zeno's paradoxes between the idea of time or space as um, made up of an infinite number of fragments and the continuous space, the continuous extension in space or time and the con continuity of the person. Now, it seems to me that this is distinctly, and I have quite a lot of neuro pathological evidence about this, that the left hemisphere tends to fragment the flow of time into this, 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 now, 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 but there's no continuity between them. And it has the same problem in, in causing space to have what Bergson called durée, as you get from the point, how do you get from a point to a line? You know, is it, what is a line? Well, it's an infinite number of points. Well, no, it isn't actually, because a point doesn't have any extension. And so you can add as many as you like. You will never produce extension. There's a difference between extension and particularity. And there is also in time, and there is also in the experience of the person, which is more like a piece of music. So all of these things have the con continuity of a piece of music where you can find a note, but it doesn't actually constitute anything really on its own. So what... What I think is that the left hemisphere tends to say, I am just this here, and I and the world have to be recreated all the time. In fact, Descartes said this. Descartes thought that everything had to be recreated moment by moment, because otherwise, how would, how would there be me now and me a minute ago? Now, that seems to me to be a problem that you get into when you're using this kind of left hemisphere thinking, which introduces all kinds of other problems, like how do I know when I look out of the window and see somebody down there in the square outside the house? How do I know that they're not an automaton dressed in a man's hat and cloak and so on? So, which was another thing he asked. And, and these are typical problems for people with schizophrenia. And schizophrenia is very much like a condition of left hemisphere overdrive with the right hemisphere Attenuated. Now, the important thing about the right hemisphere is, is, is that that which produces continuity and sees the whole. And for the right hemisphere, a fragment is never just a bit and a whole made up of those bits. Everything is a whole at its own level. So a whole is made up of things that are holes at another level, which are also holes. That, and you mentioned the fractality of um, I can't remember what exactly you were describing, but this is in a way a kind of fractality in nature. Um, uh, and I don't mean just human nature. I mean, I think in, in, the, in the order of things that we can know. So um, with the right hemisphere at work, it seems obvious that I am continuous with my former self. But for people who don't have that insight, they see it as a problem. How do I constant, how do I now relate to myself in the past? And, you know, famously, um, a, a, both a friend and a colleague at All Souls, um, Derek Parfit, the philosopher, um, believed that there was no particular continuity between a person and their person, the, that same person in the past or in the future. Um, and, and he was, admittedly, and I don't think that that's any um, secret, he, he was, um, you know, a very brilliant autistic person. And autism has some of these same very strongly left hemispheric tendencies in it. So I think it depends on how you think of yourself. But for anyone who sees themselves as an evolving process, rather than a thing followed by another thing followed by another thing, in other words, more like a river than a than a a train of trucks where each truck is linked to the next one, then, you know, it is a problem breaking up a person's experience in the way that you have just described. Interesting, interesting. This is uh, that's extremely interesting. I didn't realize I've been I've been playing around with this, uh, this idea of, of having to be recreated moment by moment. I didn't know that Descartes, uh, Descartes already said this. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that. Interesting. Yes, he did. Yes, yes. And, and as I say, he's not alone. I mean, Parfit didn't say exactly that, but he did atomize, in a way, 
um, the, the, the flow of the person, of the experience of the time by seeing it as slices. Mm -hmm. And this time slicing or space slicing to the two dimensionality that goes with it is absolutely typical of two things. People who have right hemisphere brain damage and people who have schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So in, in the matter with things, I have a whole chapter, chapter nine on the parallels between right hemisphere brain damage and the phenomenology of schizophrenia. It's absolutely fascinating because of course schizophrenia is not as unusual and it's also a spectrum. So people who are on the autistic, what, what psychiatrists call the schizo-autistic spectrum, may display many of the phenomena of the full-blown condition up to a point and it influences the way they think about what it is they're looking at. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Super, super, super interesting. Um... Okay, uh, this, the, the other thing I wanted to get your thoughts on, which relates to this issue of, of identity and, and so on, is this, and I read this, I, I can't remember where I read it, uh, what, what, but um, it was a story of a, of a therapist who had a patient and the patient uh, developed a problem with um, dissociative identity disorder. And so what would happen is he had this other personality that, you know, the patient was, uh, you know, he has a job and then there's this other personality that likes to have fun, doesn't like to go to work. And it was obviously, you know, he would pop up in the middle of the day and mess up his, uh, you know, mess up his career. So, 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 you know, they're working with the patient to integrate some sort of integrative therapy to try and, you know, sort of pull it together. And one day uh, he walks in and it's, and it's the other personality. And he says to the therapist, he says, uh, what's this I hear about integration? And the, the, the doctor says, well, you know, we'll integrate you to, to sort of, you know, be better. And he says, integrate, what's going to happen to me? I, I, and they says, well, you know, you'll kind of be gone and it'll just be the other guy that knows how to go to work. And then you know, I'm paraphrasing. And he says, excuse me, uh, what happened to your Hippocratic oath? I don't want to be gone. Make the other guy gone. I, I have a, I, my life is funny. All he does is, is go to work all day. Yeah. Have him gone. I, I'd like to, I'd like to run the show. And so, and so, uh, you know, the, the, the therapist has a real problem, right? Because, because if he does his job, that personality, which, you know, it's not a tick or a reflex, this is a full blown kind of thing that can, that can talk to you and has ration and knows what the Hippocratic oath is and has rational reasons and so on. Uh, yeah, it'll be gone in some sense. And so, so I, I just wanted to, to get sort of hear you um, talk about anything related to that and, and, and what you think about those kind of issues. Mm. Well, you, you, you've hit on another fascinating topic there. Um, dissociative identity disorder um, is, is very problematic. Um, and we do know from the viability of hypnosis that different aspects of a person can be suppressed or brought forward we don't know how. I mean, I don't think anybody understands how hypnosis works. Um, and Bernardo Castrop actually um, describes doing or a, an experiment, maybe not done by him, but in which a subject with dissociative identity disorder is um, is given an EEG and areas and she claims she's blind and the areas of her visual cortex where there's nothing wrong with them normally they do work but they just are absolutely not responding mm. so some so some kind of suggestion or some kind of self-suggestion can make bits of the person mm. Mm. um temporarily suppressed or repressed or whatever one likes to call it um and I'm not saying that this is anything to do with the two hemispheres, but it is nonetheless um, experimentally verifiable yeah. that by suppressing one hemisphere at a time, you can produce different aspects of cognitive and emotional functioning in individuals. Um, I mean, we used to be very much reliant on split brain procedures uh, and uh, those patients are relatively few and far between now, but it's well known that after the procedure for a while, although the astonishing thing was that they functioned remarkably normally, it was possible for there to be intermanual conflict. So one person, you know, would pick the flame colored dress out of the cupboard and the other one with the other hand would put it back and take out a black one, you know? And so, yeah. so you've got that kind of problem going on, yeah. which sounds a little bit like the, the patient you yeah. described. Yeah. 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 Um, and we do know that the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere do have different values. And, you know, I, uh, Ono Gruntürkun, who is one of the world's authorities on 
um, brain lateral asymmetry uh, is on record of, of saying that effectively, I believe McGilchrist is right that the two hemispheres instantiate different parts of a person. So um, I, I think that's the way I would think of it. Um, I mean, of course, it's a mistake to think that for most of us, our two halves of our brain are, are sort of constantly at war. It's not like that. That's a very crude and an inaccurate way of thinking. But it is nonetheless possible that we are balancing, and I believe we are harmonizing and balancing different uh, ways of looking at the world that come from different parts of our, our mind, uh, and most probably from different parts of our brain. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I would think about that. I, I like it because, of course, it is um, a demonstration of the fact that we're not always just this integrated entity that we think we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, they the, thank God for most yeah. purposes, we, we do do a pretty possible show of being yeah. an integrated yeah. entity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the experiment that, that you talk about with the, with the visual, uh, with the visual region being silenced, I think is really interesting. And it, it sounds to me like a, an example of a, of a more general um, kind of dynamic, which is this sort of top down control in that. Uh, and this goes to placebo effects and 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 just normal function. Exactly. Right. I I, I say to exactly. people, I say, right. If if I told you that with the power of my mind I can depolarize thirty percent of my body, you know, voltage, you know, say you're you're crazy. But but I said, well, this is what you do when you voluntarily get out of bed in the morning. You decide you're going to stand <laughs> up, and in the end, what you've done is depolarize a bunch of muscle fibers. Right. So this mm -hmm. this this mm -hmm. high level whatever executive control you can muster to 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 do voluntary actions has to, in the end, control, control uh, electrical states in, in cells. It just, it just has to, right? So, the, so there has to be this, you know, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're currently um, writing this, this piece on uh, uh, kind of this intersection between pharmacology and, uh, and, and beliefs and, and placebo and these kinds of things. And mm. I think it's a huge, and so, so I'd love to hear you, you talk about that too. I, I think it's a, it's it's a huge it's hugely important because that's where you cross levels right you normally mm -hmm. and this is you know hypnodermatology you know albert mason's kind of stuff mm -hmm. where where he was treating treating skin diseases and getting new mm -hmm. new skin cells to pop up right so so what do you think about this you know this this issue of of transcending levels right from some sort of belief structure in the top level control down to cells it's fantastically important and it's a pure dogma of a kind of science that is less scientific than it should be, that such things can't happen. Mm. The idea that mind cannot change or have an impact on matter is ridiculous. Uh, of course it does. The placebo effect is a perfect example. Indeed, even things like cognitive behavioral therapy, if you believe that um, improvement in levels of depression and anxiety is dependent on changes that can be measured in various um, neuroendocrine functions and neurochemical changes in the brain, then uh, uh, CBT, something as common and widely um, uh, attested to across the field, is dependent on getting you to think differently. And lo and behold, your brain actually changes. So it's, it's very clear. And I have quite a lot to say about that in a long chapter on consciousness and matter, which um, in which I effectively suggest, spoiler alert, that, um, that it is actually completely irrational to suppose that consciousness can somehow simply emanate from matter unless you have a different idea of matter, which I'm perfectly happy with, that matter is no mere matter. I often say materialists are not people who overvalue matter. They're people who undervalue matter. We yes. don't really know what yes. matter is. Matter yes. is capable of amazing things. I mean, if, if matter is all that is making you and me have this conversation, then matter is bloody amazing. So, yes. you know, yes. there's, so I, I take the view that matter and consciousness are not wholly distinct and that they are, in fact, manifestations at different levels or to put it a different way phases of the same element or entity so much as you know water can look like the stuff that passes my house in a stream and is translucent and can run over your hand and you know, there it is it can also be a block of ice such as we had last week which is immovable 
um, opaque and doesn't go anywhere until you move it, or it can be in this room and you can't see it, but without it, I couldn't breathe. So this, um, you know, water has phases that don't look like one another, but I think consciousness has phases that don't look like one another. I would say that matter is an importantly resistant element in consciousness, because I believe for reasons that are probably too long to go into here, but people can find out more by reading the matter with things. Um, I believe that resistance is essential to the coming into being of something. So the mm. creation of something is not done by a mere single mm. pathway or gesture, but it requires some some hurdle to be overcome, some resistance to shape it. Rather, as, as William James says rather wonderfully, my voice is the air that comes from my lungs. But if I didn't have an obstruction in my throat called my larynx, I would have no voice. So it's actually the, the, the larynx that could, the, the, all it does is obstruct the flow, but it gives him his voice. So it's a bit like that. Fascinating. Perhaps I'm Fascinating. getting too far I, away from bioelectric currents. I don't know. But no, maybe not. No, I, don't think, I, I don't think it's that far away at all. And and I think uh, I, I'm I'm in complete agreement. And you know, with with people like Chris Fields and Carl Friston, uh, really trying to give uh, a different account of matter that uh, really places it as a phase, exactly as you, as you said, as a, as a kind of behavior of mind uh, that that is more fundamental. Um, yeah. No, I think I think that's yeah. I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, I guess, I guess, uh, you know, sort of, uh, towards, um, uh, to, towards the end here, I'd love to, uh, get your thoughts on a more sort of personal, not necessarily for you and me, but, but for every, for anybody, what, what would you say is the, um, what do we take away from all this on a personal level? But, you know, so we can do science and we can do scholarship mm -hmm. and all that, but if, 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 what, mm -hmm. what do you think is you know, sort of the mm. life lessons here. What, what's the, what, what does this mean for us in terms of being beings, you know? Well, I think there's a lot really, but the most important thing to, to, to go to would be the concept of attention because it is the fundamental difference between the two hemispheres. And this is not something that I've come up with on my own. It's a very well-known fact that the left and right hemispheres pay attention to the world in different ways. And I don't think you'll find any neurologist in the world who would who dispute that. And, and the difference is largely that one play, plays uh, or offers a kind of detailed, focused, very narrow attention to a detail in order to acquire it. So it, it's, it has various qualities. It's narrow, it's detailed, it's highly focused, and it's to something that it, it, we already know what it is and we know we want it. The other attention is doing everything else meanwhile, so that while you're getting and grabbing, you're not going to be got and grabbed by something else. So it's looking at the whole picture. And so its attention is broad, open, sustained, everything the left hemisphere attention isn't, and completely uncommitted as to what it may find. It might find a predator, which is very important news, or it might find your conspecific, which is equally important news. So it's those things that one is a highly relational, uh, attention to something that is constantly reverberative, modifying itself according to what it's finding, is not integrating because its attention is already integral. So it doesn't need to integrate the fragments. The fragments come from the left hemisphere's attention. Now, if you if you think that you think about the fact that how you attend to something utterly changes what you find. So if you adopt a certain highly detached rationalistic absent kind of way of looking at something you see a mathematical pattern or you see a mechanism but you don't see the rest so i mean i sometimes say where i live in sky here there's a mountain behind my house and the, the name of this place is talisker which in 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 it comes from a norse word talisker which means the sloping rock so we know what this place meant to norsemen it meant a landmark which means danger because there's a very dangerous bay here <laughs> for shipwreck but also that same place was something completely different to the Picts who lived in the shadow of it and who found shelter there and saw it as the home of the gods. When people traveled here in the 18th century, they saw it as a, the mountain as a wonderful, um, you know, many colored shape to paint and draw. In the 19th century, they realized it was an exquisite example of um, columnar basalt. And um, to a physicist, it's 99.99% .99 space and even the other 
0.01%. We don't really know what it is. So which of these is the real mountain? There isn't a real mountain. They're all different ways of experiencing that mountain. Now, if you take that as a metaphor for the way we experience life and the world, we can see many, many different things there. And if we adopt this, I think, very narrow window of a hyper-rationalistic, and I have nothing against reason. I, I think the decay of reason and the neglect of science in our age are far more important than the supposed subjugation of everything to them. We're not scientific enough because we have dogmas which rule out various possibilities that I sense you and I might be more open to. And I think it's very irrational of us to adopt many of the positions that seem rationalistic on the surface, formulaically, theoretically, but are not rational at all if you think about the whole business of human life. So what I'm, what I'm really saying is that I think the whole purpose of writing this last book, that The Matter with Things, which is a pun on several levels, is that we have adopted a very reductionist, materialist vision of the world. And we don't have to cast away either science or reason. In fact, we need to embrace what science tells us and what reason tells us more wholeheartedly. And we will see that there is a much richer, more complex, more beautiful, entity there that we are in connection with and that it is our privilege duty whatever while we're here to respond to it and so i'm painting a different picture and you ask what is the, the the payoff of this for us as human beings and the answer is i think it can radically change people's lives and not to um appear to be um i don't know saying how, how marvelous the book is, it is a fact that I constantly get from all over the world people writing to say, your book has had a, a total impact on the way I think about things, my life is better, my work is better, my marriage is better, whatever. So something is changing in people, and I, I think that's real. I mean, <laughs> tell me it's not, you know, I, I, I don't believe you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, the, that's what, I, what's what I'd say. It has philosophical importance, but it has everyday importance. I'll just say something about the philosophical importance. Up till now, we've only been able to say, when it comes to arguing a matter in philosophy, well, this school thought this, this school thought that. Take your pick. But, and so philosophy has gone on in this way. But what I think I've been able to offer is that we can see the imprint of a left hemispheric limited way of thinking on how we would take the world. And we can see the hallmark, if you like, of viewing the world as the right hemisphere would see it. And what I've undertaken to show is that the left hemisphere is more prone to delusion, more mistaken, less reliable than the right hemisphere. Now, if that is the case, and I can demonstrate, I'd love somebody to try and refute it. I've drawn a vast body of, of literature. If that is the case, then when we take the well-known paradoxes, and I look at about 30 in chapter 16 of The Matter With Things, you can see that one way of looking at this paradox is that's the way that the left hemisphere take would be. And the other way of looking at it is this is the way the right hemisphere would be. So, for example, according to the left hemisphere, Achilles cannot overtake the tortoise. It's just impossible. But everybody knows that Achilles can easily overtake the tortoise in two or three strides. So what I think I can show is that there are at least four aspects of that particular paradox that show that the reason we get caught up in it is because we've espoused the left hemisphere way of looking at it. When we look at it from the right hemisphere's way of looking at it, there isn't a problem anymore. Now, if that is the case, and if I'm right, then I have actually added, in a modest way, something to the history of philosophy, which is that we can now make more weighted decisions about which path is mm. likely to prove in the long run more veridical, more helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Su su super interesting. Uh... I'm not surprised uh, that uh, that people um, react that way uh, to your to your work. Uh, it's so important, and people, I think, are really looking for that. I, I get emails all the time like that, asking, you know, so what, what you know, so what, what, you know, people looking for meaning in their in their life and saying so so yeah. And, and in fact, with with a couple of um, collaborators, um, we're we're actually looking at uh, trying to tackle kind of this thing. Uh, 
you know the the loss of the loss of meaning right so 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 with 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 physics with evolutionary theory with so you know some of these things have drained away with some stuff that we used to lean on and some of that correct because we weren't looking at it the right way but it needs a replacement right we need to build it back up it's fine to sort of um uh d just destroy some of those things but uh, but then we need to build it back up in a more uh in a in a more uh, in, in a better grounded more meaningful way and I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Mm. And from my point of view, it is not part of the left hemisphere's evolution that it should be looking for meaning. It's looking for stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> things. And that's why I say the matter with things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, whereas the right hemisphere is actually interested in purpose, in meaning, in what is all this about. And what we now believe is that, you know, we're meaning seeking animals and that we must have meaning so we invent meaning but i say no it's not that we invent meaning it's that we either do or don't discover meaning so in other words the meaning is not something we made up the meaning is part of the process of living if looked at more fully mm. what we are looking for is often a substitute for that which we can paint onto reality and say oh this is the meaning i've 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 found to to paint onto it, but that actually gets between us and what the, what the meaning is. And don't ask me to say in a few words what the meaning is, because right. I'm talking about something that transcends language. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Wow, uh, amazing! Uh, so so much to think about. Um, yeah, I've taken a bunch of notes here. Uh, thank you so much. This has been uh, incredibly enjoyable. Um, I'll I'll follow up. I have, I have many many other um, questions uh, later. So uh, if you don't mind, I'll follow up. Well, it's been a huge pleasure for me too, Michael, and thank you for your time. And um, I'd love to do something again with you at any point. Wonderful. Um, so thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be, I'll be in touch again. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, good. All right. Good. Bye. Have a good one. And uh, are we still recording? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I will send okay. you, I'll send Can you, you a copy. Off? Okay, that's good.